So our first uh, clip we'll show you in just a minute. I just want you to notice she, lovely woman from Australia, I was doing an attachment training there and she did a demo with me in a class. And she reported that she was in this wonderful relationship. She was hoping to get married and felt tremendously close to this man who she felt was very safe. But she noticed her own pattern as we were going through, you know, infant, uh, different attachment styles and different attachment variations of what happens early on. She said, I really, I try to relax and to be close with him, but it's like I can't stop this pattern of the, as soon as I get close, I just, she made this gesture, I just go right out the back of my head, I just associate, and I'm worried I'm going to lose this wonderful relationship. It's so much healthier than the family I came from, but I'm really worried about losing it. So I just want to show you a little bit how we move through uh, her beginning of, because she's describing dissociation, and then she kind of goes into a collapse response. She had a mother who would be close with her and very loving, but then also unpredictably would use violence in the relationship. When she actually is able to uninhibit her sympathetic reaction, right, her, her need to fight or flight, she does a fight version. I'm going to show you the flight version part of the session. When the sympathetic gets a chance to move through its natural impulse, but her impulse had been blocked over and over and over again. So the pattern of inhibiting it was really strong. So I kind of want to just let you see what happens there. But when the sympathetic is successful and in the safety of your session, right, she actually goes into a celebratory, joyful uh, sort of outburst of feeling masterful and proud. Um, in ethnology, there's a word for that in the study of animals. If the animals have been involved in a prey and predator dynamic, maybe they just finally know they're not going to be lunch, right? They actually do this kind of a celebratory leap. And the word for that, you may not be so familiar with, is pronking. Pronking. So we're going to see uh, Nerala pronk. So I want to see if you can find the pronking in this session and what it looks like in animal, ter in animal life like this. It's kind of this leap of like, hey, wow, I made it, right? Let's see if you can find that in the session as we move through. I feel very, very activated very quickly when I think about my mother. It's like my first experience of saying no to her. Mm. and there's physical violence as a result of that. She mm -hmm. said, you have to go get something. I said, no, and she hit me. And I said, now you're going to go. And I said, no, I'm not going to go. And she hit me until I said yes. Mm. So it's like that beating down of the defenses almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just take them. Again, let's put your mother as far away from you as you need. That mother as far away as you need to be. Pause that for me. And let's where? make a really tiny. Can you pause that for me? Yeah, sure. Okay, I just wanted to point out, one of the reasons I always, this is a, correct, a little mini corrective experience, when people are afraid, they tend to feel threat like right close up. So if you can just give them a little space. If you noticed, she took a big uh, deep breath when I did that. I said, put your mother as far away as you needed to be. And she kind of went, <sighs> I'm, not, I'm watching her autonomic regulation. I'm tracking what she's saying, but maybe even more important than the content, I'm tracking what's happening in her body related to what she's saying. Okay, and then she takes it a step further and says, "I want to make my mother tiny, right?" So probably she was the little one, right? We're reversing the reversing the odds. Now the mother gets to be tiny; she gets to be big. That again is a self-regulatory solution of her own autonomic creativity that takes her more into balance related to what was pretty severe threat. So we'll continue, and then we're, when we're trying to come out of a collapse, I'm going to try to go from immobility to mobility. So you'll see me ask her for action. And if there was something to do to protect yourself from your mother, what might your body want to I do? I would run away. Mm -hmm. And if you could mobilize to run, you could feel your body organizing to run. Do you have a favorite place to run? The forest. The forest, great. So just as you're organizing to run, I want you to eventually have a safe place to arrive to. Just give yourself an, a safe place to arrive to. And, what, and when you organize to run, Nerala, do you get a sense if you use your left foot or your right foot first? Left. Left foot. stop there? Right. Why do I care if she's going to use her right foot or her left foot? I mean, how can that even possibly matter? 
she has to be embodied and she has to be feeling her body organizing the flight response in order to answer that question. I always ask that question and everybody immediately answers that question. Right? And it doesn't, of course, there's no right or wrong answer. The whole point is you're trying to get into the felt sense of the running response. I'm not sending her to the track to do 10 laps, right? So the first thing is you have to hook it up to what the, uh, what the threat was. Then you're trying to evolve the impulse to respond to the, the actual threat versus I have had clients say, you know, I run, you know, 10 miles every other day to manage my anxiety. That's going to help on one level, but it's not really going to resolve their trauma history. It has to be hooked up and run through. It's more powerful. We're finding that there's a, a lot of possibility in discharging the, the blocked autonomic responses when you use this kind of rehearsal movement or organizational movement instead of gross motor movement. Anybody remember the 60s and 70s when we were like, you know, beating up pillows and that kind of stuff? I'm the only one that remembers it. Um, <laughs> Peter Levine calls that pillow abuse. You know, it's another thing for the DSM-5, you know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're doing a more subtle kind of um, work, and it actually seems to have a lot of benefits to allowing the, the nervous system to balance. That doesn't mean we never have a gross motor movement come in, but generally speaking, we work a little bit more subtly. So we can continue. So just feel your left foot initiate. And feel your toes and the floor of the forest. Maybe you're looking around a little bit to see the trees or smell the wind, or maybe there's a brook in the distance you can hear, or maybe it's sunny, but you have the shade of the trees. It's somewhat cool. God, it's so hot. <sighs> yeah. You just get a burst of heat. That's good. That's the autonomic nervous system kicking in to mobilize the, the flight response. So that's actually good. I know it's really hot. But let that heat do its thing. That's either discharging or mobilizing the action. It's very good that heat can come through. And just keep running. Just keep running till your body's done running. Just let yourself run. Oh, God, I just had this big rush of energy. Yeah, that's right. That's mobilizing your defense to run. Just let yourself have there. that energy. And so we know we're in the sympathetic now. We know we're in the active response. Now my job is to try to make sure that's manageable enough, right, that it's not going to kick her into dissociation again or, or too, much, too, much, too much energy will then cause the system to shut down again. So it's a little bit like my challenge then is a little bit like being a good surfer with finding the right wave, you know, and being able to do the maximal amount of arousal that her, her level of resiliency will tolerate without any in lack of integration or without any dissociation.